Hello, hello again, friends and loyal Wolfpack members. Chaos Wolf here, and welcome to my ultimate exploration tutorial. Now, in this tutorial, we're going to be having a in-depth look at the art of exploration in Elite Dangerous. We're going to have a look at uh, the different ships that you can use for this, how to outfit them, what I think the best exploration ship is, and how to set things up, and what equipment and what modules you are going to need. We're also going to go have a look at some tips and tricks and try and find out what you want out of exploration, whether it be simple monetary gain or whether or not you want to just see some awesome vistas. Now, without further ado, let's go and have a look at what ships you can use for exploration. All right, so what ships can you use for exploration? Now, when you hear the, ter the words exploration in Elite Dangerous, the first ship that comes to mind is the Asp Explorer, because for quite a while this was considered to be the pinnacle of exploration ships, and it is still very, very high up on the list of ships that you can use to go exploring. But there are more ships that you can use, and you don't even need to shell out as much money as it costs to get a Asp Explorer in order to go out exploring. Let's go and have a look into the shipyard and let's have a look at some of the ships that I've picked up to basically go and show what we can use in order to go exploring. You can pretty much start by going exploring in a Sidewinder. Admittedly, it's not going to offer the greatest options for exploration. Um, if you're planning to go down to visit planetary surfaces, for example, uh, the sideline is not really going to be the best thing to choose. But if you want to go out exploring as soon as humanly possible, you can do it in the humble sidewinder. But look into how to outfit certain ships in a little bit. But let's first of all move and have a look at uh, all the different types of ships that I would recommend. The next one is the hauler. The hauler is actually a little surprise entry on this list when I first found out about it. You can set this ship up to have almost around 30 light years worth of jump range. Now the main issue with this, as with the Sidewinder, is the very limited internal spaces. Here we have a grand total of four internal, uh, internal slots, and with the Sidewinder again we have four internal slots but they're much smaller so yeah it's not ideal because the main thing we're after at the moment is a good amount of internal slots so we need at least six or seven of them to get everything that we need into the ship so let's have a look over the next one i would recommend potentially is the cobra mark three now you can get a decent jump range out of this and we also have pretty much six internal compartments so this is getting onto the level of being able to use this for pretty much everything we want now its jump range is not going to be as spectacular as it could potentially be but it's also another very good low level exploration ship the next one i would recommend would be the diamondback explorer now we're actually starting to get into the staples of what a good exploration ship is now, unfortunately, this particular ship did take a little bit of a passive uh, nerf it, with the release of Horizons, because, let's see, how many internal slots have we got? We have got five internal slots, and whereas that's perfect for if we don't want to go and visit planets or go and drive SRVs around whilst we're exploring, uh, if you want to go and land on planets, that makes this ship a little bit less viable because you're going to have to do some picking and choosing later on down the line. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at that in the next section, but uh, let's carry on. Now, we also have the Type 6 Transporter. Now, this is a very nice surprise little exploration ship. You can get a good amount of jump range out of it, and it has a good selection of internal compartments. It actually has seven it has two class five, so that's going to allow you to get some really good uh, internal modules into this ship. And if you don't want to fork out for uh, an Asp Explorer, yeah, this ship is a very, very nice runner-up to the Asp Explorer. 
Next, we have the Asp Explorer. Now, this is, to many people, the quintessential exploration ship. As we can see, internally speaking, we have, again, seven internal compartments. So this has the, the class of internals that we really want, and we have a class six internal, which really does help with certain aspects of the exploration modules that we need. And yeah, so that's quite a few really nice little ships that we can go and use. But that's enough having a look at the ships themselves. Let's go and have a look at uh, how to go and outfit them. Okay, so let's have a look at the outfitting of a ship. Now, for this example, I am going to be using the Type 6, because it is a very nice little affordable exploration ship. If you don't have the greatest amount of money, you can still use this ship to great effect going out exploring. Now, I've already outfitted this, but I'm going to go and have a show you what I've put in here and explain to you why I've done it. Now, first of all, I've gone for an A2 power plant. Now, what we could end up doing is changing this over to a D3 power plant. Now, what this is probably going to do, though, is it's actually going to go and drop our maximum jump range. So that's not great. Changing this down to an A2 increases our jump range because it's a lighter module, and it even gives us a little bit more power. So instead of going for a D-rated power plant of one class, always drop it down one extra class to the A rated the class previous because it's going to be lighter and it's going to give you a little bit more power. Thrusters, now we're going to put these down to the minimum that we can do and still be able to move the ship and that is pretty much a D4 for these here. You can drop down the classes on other ships but uh, on the Type 6 that's just not possible because it just would not be able to carry the ship because you can see here it says module will exceed maximum mass so what that means is the module will not be able to move the ship because it just would not be able to generate enough thrust frame shift drive now obviously we're always going to go for the best that we can afford preferably being the best that we can fit to the ship so we've gone for the a4 anything less than that is kind of pointless now as for life support we've gone for the d2 now the reason we go for a lot of d rated uh, modules is let's have a look here if we go for the e-rated mass two and a half tons at least for this one life support d2 mass one ton all the d-rated uh, modules are the lightest that you can get so we have a look e-rated two and a half c two and a half a two and a half b four tons now obviously these uh, masses are going to scale depending on the ship and what class size they are but all the time you'll find that the D rated of that particular module is always going to be the lightest and then and because of this it's always going to be favored by explorers almost exclusively but for the power plants we're always going to go for the A rated of the lower class now with the distributor here we have this set down to a 1D and what this does is gives us the absolute maximum jump range the only downside to this is it's not going to allow us to boost uh, in order for us to be able to boost, we're going to need the 1A, pretty much at minimum. We don't want to go for the 1B, because as we've stated previously, all B-rated uh, modules are the heaviest that you will get. So, the best one for this is a 1A, and that will still allow us to boost. Now, whether you're going to boot, be, want to be able to boost or not, depends largely, almost, well, almost entirely, on whether or not you're going to go and land on planets or not. If you are going to go and land on planets and use your horizons, then you're going to be spending a good amount of time outside of super cruise. So that's what you're going to go and need. Now, admittedly, that will be dropping your jump range down a very minor amount, but it is very useful to have. Sensors, again, we're going to go for the D-rated because there's only, you can only have the same, the same size, so just set them to D-rated. Fuel tank, we're going to want the largest fuel tank that we can fit, and that's the one that comes as standard on your ship. You can't really change it. You can, if you wish, downgrade, and that will increase your jump range. The problem is, though, is it's going to mean that you're going to be able to make fewer jumps in order before you run out of fuel. So it's not great. It really massively increases the risk that you're going to run out of fuel. So just leave it at the best one you can get. 
Now, we've got a fuel scoop. We've got the best one that we can fit. We've got a 5A fuel scoop. Now, let's go and have a look. Okay, so let's compare the A-rated fuel scoop to the B-rated fuel scoop. The A-rated fuel scoop, pretty much, it draws more power. So, that's the main issue. Is uh, Yeah, we're going to end up with more power, but it's not the biggest of issues. Fuel scoop rate is the main issue here. With the A-rated, we get 0.58 tonnes a second. But with the B, we only get 0.49. So, it's going to take us longer to fill our tank up with the B-rated. Uh, so, with the A-rated, we're going to spend less time scooping and more time being able to jump from system to system. So, which is why I always recommend going for the best and largest fuel scoop that you can fit on a ship. And that's why we've gone for the A-5 here. Now, the main issue with it is that uh, the one that we have fitted currently, here it is, is just shy of 10 million credits. Well, it's a little over 9 million credits. Whereas the B-rated, where are we, is a little over 2 million. So the price difference between the A and B-rated is huge. But like I said, if you can afford it, always go for the A-rated because you'll be spending less time around stars. Now, if you don't have the money to buy the best, you can always make cuts in this area. You can go for the lower rated fuel scoop, it just means you'll spend longer scooping. But, oh well, let's move on. Uh, the next one here is the auto field maintenance unit. Here we go. The reason we have this one is it allows us to perform in-flight repairs of internal ship modules. And when you're out exploring, you can quite easily end up crashing into planets a little bit, uh, jump falling into stars, and if you do an emergency fallout of supercruise, it will damage your internal modules. It can even damage your canopy. Which, if your canopy breaks, that's a death sentence out in the middle of the void. You are not going to be able to find anywhere to fix it. But auto field maintenance units will be able to patch it up. Now, what they cannot do is uh, repair a canopy from completely broken. So please bear that in mind and always keep your canopy up to tip-top shape and condition. But I still find it a little strange that we can now go and fix our canopy with the autofield maintenance unit. But it really does help whilst going out exploring. And it really does help people exploring in Cobras because those things, their, their canopies are made out of tinfoil. The next is we have our smallest shield generator possible on the ship. We have a D3. Now, this isn't here to stop people from killing us, it's really just there to absorb impacts from landing, preferably onto planets and when we're coming back to dock. Now, the issue with this setup is we still have low thrusters, we still have D-rated thrusters. And if you're going to be landing on high gravity worlds, that's going to be making things very, very difficult. And a D3 shield generator might just not cut it, so what you might have to do is if you're planning to visit higher gravity worlds, is change your thrusters, put them up to the best you can afford, perhaps. That will give you more maneuverability and more control in higher gravity worlds. But personally, I don't bother with that. I just limit myself to low gravity worlds. And so I don't really need larger shields. This kind of build, I think, can be quite... can quite happily go and land on 1G possibly 2G worlds if you're very, very careful. But it's all down to player skill and preference, so make your mind up as you see fit. Now after this, we've got both the discovery scanners. We've got the advanced discovery scanner and the detailed surface scanner. The reason we go for the advanced discovery scanner is because when you fire it off, the ping goes out and it will discover everything in the system. You don't have to fly around looking to see whether or not you are actually missing something in the system as with the the intermediate discovery scanner and the basic discovery scanner. The basic discovery scanner is obviously the worst of all of these and it only has a range of 500 light seconds, which is okay if you're just starting out and want to get a few little scans. The intermediate discovery scanner, that will, that will have a range of 1000 light seconds, so it doubles the previous range. But, as I said, the Advanced Discovery Scanner has an unlimited range, and just firing off one pulse will discover everything in a system. Now, the Detailed Surface Scanner is something that you're going to need if you want to do exploration properly. Because what the Detailed Surface Scanner does is it upgrades your 
scans in level of class. Because there's three different types of scans. There's class 1, class 2, and class 3. A class 1 scan is just firing off your discovery scanner and just seeing things on your system map. You'll see them as unexplored. We'll have a look at this properly a bit later. A class 2 is actually getting close enough to scan that without a detailed surface scanner. That class is a class 2 scan. But with a class 2 scan, you will not get your name on it if you are the first to discover it. In order to do that, you need a detailed surface scanner. So, if you want to have your name on things, get yourself a detailed surface scanner. They are a little bit pricey. I mean, let's have a look at it. Here we go. It's going to set you back a quarter of a million credits. But even so, that's nowhere near as bad as the advanced discovery scanner, which is going to set you back about one and a half million. Yep, there we go. Just over one and a half million credits. So, it is a very expensive piece of kit, but it is extremely useful. Now, the last one here is the planetary approach suite, but that comes with any ship now. So, and it doesn't have any weight to it, so you don't even really need to worry about that at all. But what you might see is we've got two internal compartments that are empty. And this is for something that we haven't yet talked about, and that is the planetary vehicle hangers. And here we go. There is the planetary vehicle hanger right here. Now, when it comes to planetary vehicle hangers, you have two types. You have rating G and rating H. Uh, the main difference is rating H are heavier, but use less power. Rating G are lighter, but use more power. Basically, the rating G ones are the one we want. Yes, they use more power, but we don't need to worry about this because we can just turn these off when they're not in use. So let's go and buy one. We've gone for a class four. Now, one thing to note is planetary vehicle hangers only come in even classes. You can get them in class two, class four, class six, and class eight. There are no, you can't get them in any other classes. Now, you wouldn't use a class eight because the only ships to have class eight internals are the cutter and the type nine. At least as far as I remember right now. But on average, you're going to want a class 4 or a class 6, just so you can have a couple of extra vehicle slots. Because you can go for a class 2, but you're only going to have one. And if you accidentally get it destroyed, that's it. You're not going to be able to get another one whilst being out. So a class 4 is the minimum recommended size for a planetary vehicle hangar. And then what we want to go and do is just go and put in a couple of SRVs. So we'll go and get a couple of scarabs. There we go. So now we're fully outfitted for landing on planets. And what this is going to give us is going to, as, as you can see, drop down our jump range to 27.91 light years. So we're losing one and a bit to light years worth of jump range. But it really is a balancing act at the moment, depending on what you want. Now, the second empty internal compartment here, you can really choose what you want to have in this one. What I would recommend is a cargo rack, simply because when you're driving around on planets, you might find something like gold, platinum, palladium, uh, battle weapons or so on that you might want to pick up. Uh, you might even come across uh, unidentified, uh, well, unknown artifacts or something. So you can always just go and pick these up and have things in your cargo and bring them back and sell them on the way back. It's up to you. Uh, that's what I like to take with me, but what you can end up doing is just going and putting in a second auto field maintenance unit. And this is very nice if you're going for a very, very long exploration trip. Alternatively, what you could do is put in a second planetary vehicle hangar, and this will give you a, a few more vehicles. It really depends on whether or not you're going to end up crashing them into the planet or not. But here we can see the difference between the G and the H. G you can see is only 10 tons the h is 20 tons so you can see the g would drop us down to 26.6 light years the h would drop us down to 25.45 so yeah it's really up to you what you want auto field maintenance units by comparison don't have any weight to them whatsoever uh, neither do cargo racks by themselves it's only the cargo that goes into them that actually has the wa the mass basically whatever you want to go in there it's up to you. And that is pretty much how to set up an exploration ship. 
Now, the reason I was saying that the Diamondback Explorers had a bit of a passive nerf is because it only has five internal compartments. And you kind of want a little bit more than that if you're wanting to go and visit planets. Because you're going to want a fuel scoop, that's one. Autofill maintenance units, that's two. Vehicle hangar, that's three. Shield generator, that's four. And five and six for the two different scanners. So you're going to want a minimum of six internal compartments. The Diamondback Explorer only has five internal compartments. So at that point, you're going to want, have to decide whether, first of all, whether or not you want to go and land on a planet. And second of all, if you do want to go and land on a planet, what are you going to leave out? Are you going to go without a shield generator or are you going to go without a uh, auto field maintenance unit? Because those are the only two things that you can swap out. Because you need a fuel scoop and you need both the scanners. You can't go without them. So, like I said, the Diamondback Explorer is a lot, kind of a bit less viable now that Horizons has been released. But, as I said, if you don't have Horizons or you're not planning to go and land on planets, the Diamondback Explorer is still a very good ship. But, anyway, that's enough for pretty much putting together the Explorer ship. Now, let's go and have a look at what I think the ultimate exploration ship is. And those of you that know me are not going to be surprised at all. Yep. Yeah. That's right, it's the Anaconda. Now, there are a bunch of reasons why I think this ship is the ultimate exploration ship. The first of all is the jump range. You can get this ship up to around about 40 light years worth of jump range. But that is if you don't want to go and land on planets. If you do want to go and land on a planet, then you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Most notably is the vehicle hangar, and here you can see I've got a class 6, which gives me 4 uh, vehicle bays. So if I lose a ship, uh, lose an SRV even, I don't really need to worry about it. Although I have just returned from an exploration trip where I, was, I spent a lot of time out and uh, I didn't lose a single SRV. So... At the end of the day, it's really debatable what size of planetary vehicle hangar you want to take. It's all down to personal preference. I was originally planning to be out for a lot longer, but decided to call it quits and come back early. Uh, the next reason I like this ship is because we have a Class 7 internal compartment. And I use this for an A7 fuel scoop. Now, let's go and have a look at what this will be. I mean, let's just click here and go and compare, because this is the basic uh, fuel scoop, an E1. That'll give you 0 0.02 tons a second. <laughs> A7, 1.25 tons a second. You can scoop for over a ton of fuel a second in this ship. You can go from empty to full in this ship for an around about 35 seconds, 36 seconds. It's insane. You spend so little time around stars that you you can just jump from one star to the next, just kissing the star, and you're almost full to fuel, full fuel again. This I, I just absolutely love having this fuel scoop. It is pretty much on par <laughs> with Starkiller Base. But yes, that's... I absolutely love having the best fuel scoops. Now, the only ships that can have a better fuel scoop than this are the Cutter and the Type 9, and neither of those are particularly good exploration ships. Now, as you can see, we have an absolute wealth of internal spaces as well. I've got a crap ton of cargo racks just because I didn't know what else to put in there, and I thought, you know what, I just might as well put those in there. I've got two auto field maintenance units, and I have the power to run them both at the same time. Now, with both the auto field maintenance units, you can run them at the same time and they will both activate at the same time to repair your internal modules. And doing so will speed up the repair of said modules. Now, I've also got the detailed service scanner, the advanced discovery scanner, and I've even got a D3 shield generator. Yes, a D3 shield generator, the same size of shield generator that we had on the Type 6, fits the Anaconda. 
Now, admittedly, just sneezing at the anaconda will pretty much be almost enough to take a couple of rings off that shield, but it's enough for when you're coming into dock and when you're landing on planets. Now, looking up, I do have D5 thrusters rather than anything else, because then we have a class 7 housing. We can pretty much mount 7A thrusters, but doing so, let's have a look, class descending. There we go, 7A is going to knock a couple of light years, well, f nearly four light years off our jump range. So that's not ideal, and it also puts up our power consumption immensely. So sticking with D7 thrusters, I'll say D5 thrusters even, is really good because it still allows us to get around and we can land on planets, but we can do have to limit ourselves to low gravity worlds. I have managed to land on planets with 1.3 Gs of gravity, but I had to be very, very careful about it. I couldn't come in too steep. It is doable, but you need a lot of patience and skill to do it. Uh, let's have a look. What else? I've also got a standard docking computer. Just because when I come back into civilized space, maybe I'm a little bit rusty. Let's just let the docking computer put me in. You don't need it. It's just something I like. But I do think this is an absolutely amazing ship. I mean, let's have a look. If I was to sell this, that would put us up to 37 and a half light years. So let's do that. Let's, let's sell that. And then what we can then go and do is drop our thrusters potentially even more. Let's have a look. Can we do this? No, actually, no, we can't. We have to stick with the D5s. But what we can then do is power distributor. We can then go and drop this down to a D1. That would take us up to 38.82 light years of jump range. Yes, we can't boost. But if you're not planning to go down to planets, it's not really necessary. So, like I said, you can get close to 40 light years of jump range out of this ship. The main issue I have with it is that it is slightly sluggish in supercruise. Now, let's go and get my planetary vehicle hangar back. So there we go, all stocked up again and back to 36.46 light years of jump range. And... For that amount of jump range, this is a very, very nice little ship. Now, admittedly, it's going to set you back a pretty, pretty penny. And this has ended up costing me around about 234 million credits. Well, 235 all but the kicking and screaming. And this was, was with discounts from Li Yong Li Space. So, yes, it will set you back a lot of money. But like I said, this is just the ultimate exploration ship. You don't have to have it. It's just what I find to work the best. But now, there is one more thing I've got to point out about uh, outfitting your ship, and that is the paint scheme. You wouldn't think that a paint scheme would be all that important, but trust me, it is. When you're out exploring... You want to try and avoid dark paint schemes like the Black Friday. I mean, I went out with the Black Friday paint scheme because when I went out exploring, I just got it. I got excited about having it. It was the first skin I had, or technically the second skin beyond the gold one, for the Anaconda. So I thought, yes, I'm definitely going to go out in that one. I went out in the Black Friday and immediately regretted it. Well, I say immediately regretted it. I kind of regretted it after about 5,000 light years because... Going into debug cam, trying to take pictures of my ship was a nightmare. Because it's so dark, It trying to take pictures of it in space, to black ship, against a black background. It's a nightmare trying to take pictures of it. So what you want to do is get yourself lighter paint schemes. It doesn't matter what they are, you just don't want something that's that dark. If it's dark, then you're going to have more of an issue trying to get good screenshots. If you're not interested about screenshots, don't worry about it. But then again, if you're not worried about screenshots, you're not going to be worrying about uh, paint schemes anyway. But just thought I'd mention it. But now, what we're going to go and do is we're going to go and have a look at how I set up my fire groups. Okay, so let's go and have a look at how I would set up my uh, fire groups and my power priorities. 
Now, this is very, very simple. Advanced Discovery Scanner is the only fire group you're likely to have. So, say it's a fire group one. Depending on whether or not you set up your heat sink launchers to a dedicated key on the keyboard or on your HOTAS, uh, you can either set them to a fire group button or just use the dedicated button for them. It really depends, it's all down to personal preference. Personally, I have them set down on a button on my HOTAS, so I don't need to worry about setting them up here. So, yeah, that was simple, wasn't it? Now, yes, the previous section was a little short, but that was purposefully so. Now, what we're going to have a look at here is how I go and set up my power priorities in order for this ship to function. Now, because we don't have enough power to run everything at the same time, I've pretty much just turned off the auto field maintenance unit and the cargo hatch and one of the heatsink launchers. So that's pretty much all we need in order to make this work. I mean, I don't even need to have the auto dock on. I can go and quite happily turn that off. And for that, and then I can then go and turn on one of the heatsink launchers again. But it's a bit of give and take, really. I mean, I don't need to have my shields on whilst I am outside of habitable space, because there's no enemy ships, at least not at the moment. Michael Brooks has said that later on there may be, well, there will be alien ships out of the depths of space later on, but at the time of publishing this video, there's nothing out there. So I will revisit this after that happens. So what you can do is you can turn off your shields, shields and turn line. on both the auto field maintenance units. So that basically when you're out flying around, you can then just go and fix the rest of your modules at double the speed. And that's pretty much all you really need to know, apart from if you are going to go and land on planets, the thrusters, when you touch down, will go and turn themselves off. So you do get a 30% reduction in your overall power consumption. So you can always factor that into things as well. I mean, I don't bother because I like to keep things a little bit more simple. But anyway, that's pretty much all you really need to know. But you don't want to turn off your sensors because otherwise you're not going to be able to see anything on your radar panel. So yeah, that's, like I said, pretty much all you really need to know about this. I have touched briefly upon the different types of scanners earlier in this video, but I thought I'd go in a little bit more detail here. There's basically two different types of scanner. There's the discovery scanners and the surface scanners. Now, the discovery scanners are what you use to actually go and discover the planets themselves. There's three different types of these. There's the basic discovery scanner, which will allow you to discover planets anywhere up to 500 light seconds away from where your ship currently sits. The intermediate discovery scanner ups this somewhat to 1000 light seconds away from your ship. Uh, both of these are okay scanners, they're alright if you are exploring on a budget, but the one that most explorers will use is the advanced discovery scanner. The reason for this is it has an infinite range. Send off a pulse anywhere in the system, it doesn't matter, you will automatically discover everything in the system. So that's why most people will go for this one, it's just ease of convenience. But as I did say, there are two different types of scanners. There is also the detailed surface scanner. Now what this does is, it, as I said previously, it ups your scans from class 2 to class 3. Now, what do I mean between different classes? Class 1 sending the pulse off, class 2 is scanning the, star, uh, the celestial body, and class 3 is scanning the celestial body whilst using a detailed surface scanner. It basically just allows you to pick up and catalogue so much more information about a celestial body, a planet, star, whatever. It gives you more information. But most importantly, it allows you to get your first discovered by tag on said body. So, if you want to get your name on things, 
you have to have this. And even if you don't want to get your name on things, it's still recommended to have because the scan data just will not be worth as much. Alrighty, so now after you've got your ship bought, paid for, all fully set up, you've then got to go and decide what you want out of exploration. Beyond whether or not you're going to go and land on planets or not, first of all is, what do you want out of exploration? Do you want to just try and get as much money as possible? Or do you want to go and visit interesting looking systems? Do you want to go there for the experience or do you want to go there just to get to elite and exploration? If you want to go for some good looking views, what you want to go and do then is potentially just go and have a look at some nebulae. And as you can see here, we have the California Nebula. We've also got the Witch Head Nebula, the Orion Nebula, Barnard's Loop. There's lots of places you can go. We've also got the Pallades Nebula. And where are they? We've got the Lagoon Nebula around somewhere. I forget where it is. But you've also got the Coal Sack Nebula. Lots of different things. There's loads of interesting parts of space you can go and look for. And not only that... But there is, if we go and have a look, the core of the universe, Sagittarius A. Yep, here we have Sagittarius A. This is the core of the universe. It is the largest black hole in the entire universe. And uh, it is quite a pilgrimage to go there. The main issue is that, as you can see, there is a metric crap ton of stars. There's an absolutely insane star density around the core. As you can see with me just scrolling out, I was getting an absolute massive drop in frames just doing that. But it is a really nice place to go and visit because it's just so different from anywhere we see in the in the bubble. Alternatively, you can always head out to the very edges of the universe and go and see how far you can get out. But this way, you've got to be worried, be careful because you, you stand a good chance of running out of fuel if you don't know how to navigate the star map. If you're just after exploration data, what you might want to do is, let's have a look here, is you can always head to around about here. Let's have a look. We want to go to about minus 1,300. Around about this area and you'll be able to find a lot of these, a lot of neutron stars. And these are a great place to come and go and farm, farm exploration data. In fact, I'm probably gonna end up jumping back out this way again at some point in the future, just to get the last 13 million that I need to reach elite. So yeah, if you want to come this way, you can always go to the neutron fields, which is roughly around about this area. In fact, it does kind of extend virtually around the entire area here and it's anywhere from this area but you have to be around about 1000 to what 2000 light years down on the core as you can see it here you've got the different core coordinates the center one here is how high or how far up or down you are on the plane you've got the left and the right and you've got the forward and back so that's pretty much the three-dimensional coordinates you need but this is a kind of a good place to start because they will have neutron stars aplenty around here. But the best way to find them is actually coming in here and using the star class. You go into map, you go into show by color and change this to star class. Now the first thing you're going to want to do is unclick the LTY proto stars, carbon stars and well not necessarily the wolf riots but it's all up to you. But pretty much anything there, anything left from M class and up, is scoopable stars. So anything that's left now, you can go and scoop fuel from. Anything below here, you will not be able to scoop fuel from. So be warned, these ones will be offer you false hope of getting fuel back for your ship and will often leave you just fuelless, drifting out in nowhere. Because what I did by accident one time is I ran out of fuel by just flying around like, like it's so. And what this does is just has non-sequencing stars. 
uh, checked. And what this leaves you with is neutron stars and black holes. Now, neutron stars are what you want to go and scan for some of the best uh, credit to systems visited ratio. You've also got these black holes. Now, first one here, and tell me about it, wins a prize. You get the no prize of, yes, you're, you're great, you found this black hole that I showed you. <laughs> I'll be surprised if I get out here and this is still discovered, still undiscovered even. But yes, this is a good area, because as you can see, there's a lot of neutron stars. I need to scan around about 200 more to 300 more in order to get my last bit of uh, data needed to get to Elite. So that's what I'm going to be doing in about a week or two. Yeah, so, like I said, if you want to go and scoop, you want everything from O to M. There's, there's a couple of acronyms for it. I'm not going to bore you with them. It's like, well, actually, no, there is KGB foam, and there's another one which I don't remember. But basically, anything M and up, you can scoop from. Anything below, you can't. Now, like I said, the non-sequencing stars are going to be the best available, and they are going to give you the best bang for your buck. But the next best ones are pretty much the white dwarf stars. So there we go. That increases everything you can scan by even more. Now, these are round about two-thirds to half the price that you'll get for neutron stars. So it's up to you whether or not you want to bother scanning them or not. But... Also, bear in mind as well, if you do go and be the first one to discover that uh, celestial body and you are the first one to sell the data on it, you will get a 50% bonus to discovery data. I think it's 50% at least, anyway. So, and that will count towards your uh, total for Exploration Elite. Well, that's about how you go and navigate the star map. M and up for scoopable, the bottom two for if you really want to go and get the best bang for your buck for scanning systems. But like I said, if you want to just go out and explore and have fun, go to wherever you want. Ice rings are great to go and have a look at. Nebula are good to go and have a look at. Uh, ice rings in nebulae are great. They look amazing. In fact, I will link a few pictures later on at the end of the, this uh, tutorial to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so here we are out in, well, I'd say the middle of nowhere. We're actually still in the bubble. We're still about 25 light years away from Jonai. But this is a system that I do not have any scan data on. As you can see, I've spotted the star ahead of me. And if I look at the system map, it shows us these four stars here. Now, it claims that I don't have any system data here because I haven't sent out a level 1 pulse. So let's go and do that. We'll charge up the Discovery Scanner. You can see that you have to hold it down until it charges. And there we go, it's complete. We've discovered four new objects. So now let's jump back into the system map. And you can see that we've, again, we've got all the stars here, but we've also got one planet that we didn't have beforehand. Now you can see this uh, first discovered by tag, and this has been discovered by Harface. It also tells you how far the body is away from the parent star. And the rest of these have been discovered by Anwen. Now in order to get your name on these and these discovered tags, like I said, you need a advanced discovery scanner. But currently we've only done a level one scan. So that pretty much just shows that we have sent out a pulse, that's it. Everything shows as unexplored. In order to show it as explored, you need to actually target it and look at the body. You need to have it within a, round, a roughly a 30 degree cone in front of your ship. And then if you have it targeted, if you're looking at it, you will scan it. And there it shows as a class M star. So we go back into the system map. And in the system map, it will give us the information. It will give us the name of the celestial body. And we can then go into the details and it'll tell us more about it. We'll have solar masses, this, we'll have just all the information that we need. I mean, let's have a look at this guy. That is 10,000 light seconds away. So let's actually go and target this one for the sake of it. And let's actually go and scoop a bit of fuel as well. 
Because this is a class M star. We can Field scoop. Scooping. You can see, Field I've got just engaged. over a ton of fuel a second there. So, Field if I had a smaller fuel scoop, then we wouldn't have been able to scoop that fast. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically just go and fly over to this body and we're going to go and scan it because as you can see we're not scanning it yet the reason for that is because it's way too far away now the distance that you need in order to scan or start scanning uh, a celestial body is it's dependent on how large that body is the higher the mass of the object the further away you can start scanning it from now this is just what looks to be a high metal content world so it's just a little planetoid and if we have a look at the system map in fact it might actually tell us the size of it already let's go find out earth masses 5.3 so that's actually quite a large planet so i would expect to start being able to scan that from a little distance so let's go and find out when we actually start scanning it from Right, so we've got a lot closer. Let's just see how close we have to get in order to start scanning. There we go. Around about 130 light seconds we managed to start scanning this planet. Now that's because it was over 5 Earth masses. If you're around about 0.2 of an Earth mass, you have to get to around about 50 light seconds in order to start scanning. So. The mass of the thing does affect it, but the only time it's ever going to be a massive, massive difference is when it's thousands and thousands of Earth masses, or solar masses, when it's pretty much stars. That's the only time you're ever going to have a massive difference with it. So there we go. We've now got a high metal content world. Let's go and have a look what it says in the system map now. So here we go. We found out it's a high metal content world, and we found out it's also it's not terraformable. If it were, it would say at the bottom it's a candidate for terraforming. And if it is a candidate for terraforming, that basically means that we're going to be able to make the world habitable for humans after changing the environment. But that's not the main reason we want terraformable worlds. The terraformable worlds pay out a lot, lot more. Uh, it goes from a normal high metal content world is going to pay out between 5,000 and 10,000 credits, let's say. Uh, a terraformable high metal content world is going to pay out 36 to 54,000 credits. So you can see it goes up to 10 times more, or over 10 times more. So it really, decide, it really kind of shows the difference that a terraformable property of a planet will make. But that's pretty much the basics of going around and scanning. Now, originally, before one of the last major updates, you weren't able to go and target a specific celestial body in the system map. Originally, you had to go and fly out over the galactic plane, spot the orbital lines yourself, and count out the, the planets, which was a nightmare. I am so glad we don't have to do that anymore. So, you just look in the galaxy map, choose which one you want to go and have a look at, and go and target it. Now, talking about terraformable worlds or not, what you need to find is worlds that are within the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone is the distance from a star that is not too warm, not too cold, hence the name Goldilocks zone. And this zone varies from star class to star class. Uh, believe it or not, neutron stars actually have a Goldilocks zone of around about 2,500 light years. So, give or take so much. I don't really know exactly what it is, because you don't really need to know. If something looks like it might be terraformable, like it has a hue to it, it might be showing up blue, then that is a good chance that that might be terraformable. But anyway, like I said, this is just the basics of how to scan. Now what we want to go and do is have a look at what to go and scan. So, let's go and have a look at that now. Now, as I said, certain planets are going to be worth a lot more than others, especially terraformable worlds. And when you're going out exploring, if you want to get yourself basically just up to elite in exploration, you want to go and pick and choose the best worlds that you want to go and scan. 
Now, what I'm not going to go and do is list off all the prices for all the planets that you can go and scan. What I'm going to do is just give you the cliff notes, really. So, here they are. You can either write them down, or there will be a link in the description to the wiki where I got these from. Okay, so in order to go and sell your data, you need to come into the Universal Cartographics. You can either sell by individual system, where you can go and have a look at what was in that particular system, or you can just scroll up and sell by page. It'll tell you how much it costs to buy that page, uh, to sell that page even, and if you are the first to discover something, you will be greeted with this. Now that is really nice, especially when it just keeps on going. But for those of you who say that there is not enough, well there's nothing left out there to be discovered, I'm sorry but that is wrong. According to Frontier, at last count, less than 1% of the entire galaxy has been discovered. So there is a lot out there. You just need to go and travel the paths less trodden. Now, like I said, there is a way of finding out what a planet is before you actually go and scan it. Uh, here we are, we have a system here with a couple of high metal content worlds and one ammonia world. Now, what you need to do in order to find out what they are is you need to listen to them. And yes, I know that sounds crazy, but what you need to do, you need to target them, zoom all the way in, and then just sit and listen. It helps if you have headphones, so let's do that now. Now, I don't know if you can hear it, but there is a sound of wind blowing over, just blowing along. It's like, whoosh, kind of sound. Yeah, I, appalling, appalling thing I know for me to do. But that is pretty much denotes a high metal content world. It might show up as a rocky world as well. I'm not sure. What's this one? Is this a rocky world? Yeah, it, this wind's sounding here for this rocky world as well, but it is a different kind of windy sound. But the ammonia worlds hover over them. Now, there's a very subtle sound here. I'm not quite sure what to class it as, but it's just very subtle. It's almost like a bubbly kind of wind, almost. Now, pretty much every type, uh, every class of planet will have a unique sound. Water worlds will sound like bubbling water, and Earth like worlds will have like bird, like almost like birds chirping. So you can tell what a world is before you go and scan it, even if it doesn't look like it's going to be that particular type. So if you see something blue or something brown, you might get surprised to find out it's actually a water world. Or it might even be a high metal content, which you think is an Earth-like. But So there are ways of finding out before you get to go and scan them. This is very useful to know, especially if you start spot something blue that is three quarters of... Uh, a light year away from the main star, then you can decide whether or not you want to go after it. Right, so now you should pretty much know whatever you need to know in order to be successful at exploration. Yes, it was a lot of information, and yes, this was one hell of a mammoth project. So, uh, if you did enjoy the video and if you did find it useful, please do hit those like and subscribe buttons because that really does help my channel out. But before I go, I just wanted to share this with you, what's up on the screen now. It's the Visual Guide to Exploration. It was made by Commander Nutter and inspired by Commander Vault. Now this is an absolutely amazing visual guide. It shows you roughly what you should be looking for and gives you some ideas as to what you should head towards. If it looks like anything in the water world or Earth-like or ammonias, you should definitely be going for those. It also shows you the different classes of stars by their appearance 
and pretty much every other planet there. So it is a great little thing. Now I'm just going to leave it up on the screen here and I'm also going to link it in the video description so you can go and find it if you want it yourself. But anyway guys, that's it for this mammoth video. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Commander Chaos Wolf, you guys have been epic, I will see you soon. And until then commanders, keep flying and stay shiny.